So when you look at tragedy and the sovereignty of God, uh, this is a, a question that uh, came to the, uh, the church in Rome because the Jews there uh, had, had either you know, family members, people they had known, were part of what happened with the crucifixion. And so the question arose in the Roman church, because we were instrumental in turning over the Messiah, the anointed one, to Roman authorities to be crucified, does that mean God is finished with us? Have we committed the ultimate atrocity? And Paul's answer to them is no, that your sin, the tragedy, doesn't, doesn't trump the greatness of God and what his plans are. Isn't that awesome? That God works in such a fashion. And so their questions about the sovereignty of God um, are what Paul is, is answering. He's answering them in what I call the diatribe format. Do you remember what a diatribe is? You're not talking to me today? Diatribe, what's that format? You ask a question like an attorney, you provide an answer. Diatribe. Uh, that's what you do. And so that's what Paul's doing here. And so he's, a, he's ans, asking and answering typical Jewish questions about the sovereignty of God concerning the atrocity of the cross and how God will turn that into an ultimate victory. And so we want to review, um, because you may have forgotten what we've talked about over the last several weeks, uh, and uh, I won't hold that against you. I'll pray for you. But uh, let's, let's just review quickly what we've covered in the question and answer series. Remember, the, the Jews want to know, is God finished with us as a nation? And so that's going to be the first question in his diatribe format. So question number one, by way of review, does Israel's spiritual, spiritual failure uh, in, re, in their rejection of the Messiah nullify God's promises to them as a nation in the Old Testament? Answer, no. Why? Whom God chooses, he does not unchoose them. And the, many of those promises to ancient Israel were unconditional in nature as we looked at as, as when we studied the Abrahamic covenant, the Palestinian, all the covenants. They're from God himself. Number two, that logically devolves into another question. Um, do God's precise choices demonstrate that he's unjust? Because when God was forming a nation, Paul said he didn't choose everybody that was part of the genetic line to form Israel. He specifically only chose some to be of the line, and he didn't choose others. So if you go back and review, he didn't, well, he didn't pick Ishmael. He chose Isaac. Isaac, one person. None of the rest of you were here when we talked about that. Uh, he chose Isaac, not Ishmael. He chose Jacob, not Esau. So he's winnowing down who he wants, but he's choosing. From our culture, what do we say? It's only fair if you choose everybody. Huh? I mean, have you seen our culture like when you, Little League, and it's like well, no, no team can win. Everybody wins. Huh? That's not the way I grew up. There's a victor, there's a loser. Well, no, we have to be fair to everybody and just everybody. See, when God comes down, he's choosing one son, not the other son. Why? Because he's sovereign and he's making a sovereign free will choice based on his great character to accomplish his purposes. Uh, and, and Paul says, just go with the greatness of God. But that's, that's what they were entertaining. Is, is God unjust? And God unjust? Which then leads to question three. Uh, since God chooses to bless or to curse as he chooses people and doesn't choose other people to accomplish his purposes, then how can he hold us accountable? If he's choosing things that are going to be his will, like as we talked about last week, he chose Pharaoh to do what Pharaoh did. Um, since he said that he was going to harden the heart of Pharaoh, then how can he hold Pharaoh accountable for his actions? Well, uh, just by way of review, God has his sovereign choices to do things, accomplish his will, and his dimensionality. In our dimensionality, it appears that we have free will, doesn't it? Right? When you go to, go to lunch after church, you get to look at the menu. Is God telling you you're stuck? It's going to be, it's, it's the Big Mac. You have no other choices. No, no, you have free will to do what? I'm going with the fish sandwich, right? Just to break it down. So our perspective looks like we have free will. We have free will. God says, I'm decreeing things in my dimensionality. You'll not outfox my free will, which means you're responsible for your actions. Otherwise, how could he judge you? And so when it comes down to Pharaoh, Pharaoh, was hard, his heart was hardened by God, but he also hardened his heart. But like I said last week, by way of review, he was a sinner long before God hardened his heart. Well, this is going to lead to another question that will arise in verses 22 to 29. Question four. If God is just, why does he react slowly concerning sin and evil? I mean, why doesn't he act quicker? Like, why didn't he stop Pharaoh 
uh, Amenhotep II, the pharaoh of the Exodus, why didn't he deal with him sooner rather than later? Uh, it, it appears to us that God is perhaps unjust. It's interesting how we are quick to call God into our courtroom to say, based on the evidence that I've seen from this week at the Kavad Synagogue and the shooting at the university, it must appear that God is somewhat asleep. In fact, we will have people in our culture who will even mock Christians who pray. It's unbelievable. Basically, it's kind of like, where's your God? Same place he was when his son was crucified. He's going to take a tragedy and turn it into a triumph. Is this how God operates? And so the question is, if he's just, why does he react so slowly to sin? Which means, if we were God, what would we do? You don't know what you would do? Would you act sooner? I mean, haven't you thought these thoughts as you're listening to the news and watching television? Well, if I was God, I would just, I'd just vaporize that guy. Just right there. I mean, lightning bolt, whatever needed. Just gone. You know, no, he takes his time. So why? Well, God has great purposes. And so listen to Paul's complex. I'm not going to tell you this is simple. This is a very complex section of scripture. But I'll try to break it down. Uh, notice what he says in answer to the question. He says in verse 22, what if, it's a conditional statement, so what if God, although willing to demonstrate his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much patience vessels of wrath, i.e., like Pharaoh, prepared for destruction? And suppose he did this to make known the riches of his glory upon vessels of mercy, believers, uh, which he prepared beforehand for glory. Uh, who? Well, he says, well, even us, uh, whom he also called, doctrine of election, um, not from among the Jews only, but he, uh, he also called from among the Gentiles. What makes this extremely complicated, this is an if statement with no then statement. You follow me? Uh, there's an if part of this, and there's no then part of this. Um, so if you present something that's a, an if statement, you're looking for them to get to the, to the then. So if, as I was talking to the soldiers this week about, you know, jumping out of planes, what's that like, etc., you know, they're, they're on a static line, so they're all running out of the plane together when the light goes off, and as they jump out, the chute deploys. Because if you jump out of the plane that's hooked on a static line, what's the effect? Are there any Army airborne here? Yeah, they're so quiet. Yeah, and, and by the way, those were the largest, most muscular humans I've ever seen in humanity. I felt so safe there. It's like everyone was like 6'4 and must live at the gym all day. It was unbelievable, even the chaplains. Anyway, back to my sermon. So <laughs> if, then, cause, effect. But Paul doesn't get to the, he doesn't get to the effect. Why didn't he throw it in there? Because he thinks you should already have brain enough to know it. So if God does what he's going to mention here, well, then why does he do that? Well, because he's God. He's sovereign. He's loving and kind and merciful and holy. And you must understand, Paul says, fill in the blank. He can do what he wants. It's the best thing. So let's look at what, is he, what he says here in this conditional sentence. Why is God reacting so, so slowly to sin with people like Pharaoh? Uh, answer, he's going to give two answers. Answer number one, he has purposes. He always has purposes, grand purposes. Uh, he's sovereignly in control of all things, which means he will bring them to his purposeful end. Uh, and number two, his vast character is so amazing that end can only be amazing. So let's look at the purposes that he talks about here. There's uh, purpose number one that God has in moving slowly with sin. Purpose number one concerns the lost or the non-Christian. Notice what he says. What if God set up a scenario uh, where he was willing to demonstrate two things? What does God want to demonstrate to the lost? He tells you through two infinitives here. He wants to demonstrate his what? His wrath. Do you find that kind of shocking? What does God want to show the lost above all things? What's he say? His wrath. Huh? You would think that if you were God, you would want to showcase what first? His love. Well, he, he does show them his love, as we're going to talk about. But if you reject his love over and over again, eventually he shows you his wrath. So he says God has two, two, two purposes toward the lost. Number one, to show them his wrath. Number two, to show them his, what's the second one? His power. These are two infinitive clauses. They're purpose statements in, in the Greek text. Uh, so let's, let's look at this. Number one, he wants to show uh, in slowness of moving toward judgment his wrath. Why does he take his time? So that when his wrath is revealed in due time, no one can say it's unjust because he gave so much time before it came. See, we're clever. Had God 
moved quickly with Pharaoh Amenhotep II and took him out soon, well, then everybody could have then said, well, he's unjust because he didn't give him a chance. No, he's merciful, kind, long-suffering, patient, but he's also holy and jealous, and there's wrath if you reject him. So Paul says, concerning the loss, he wants to demonstrate his wrath. Uh, and the, the word wrath in the Greek text uh, is not indefinite. It has an article in front of it, which means the wrath. What's that mean? Well, that's the eschatological end-time day of the Lord wrath. That's what he's talking about. See, it's the very thing that our world uh, doesn't anticipate coming. Because if you truly believe that God is going to come and judge you, if you reject his son, for everything you've ever said or done, he has record, ever thought. That would change the D.C. environment immediately. Would it not? He says the wrath is coming. Uh, Paul talks about in Romans chapter 2, verse 5, using the word the before the word wrath. Chapter 2, verse 5, what does he say? Speaking to the Jews of his day. But because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath, the wrath, uh, for yourself in the day of wrath and the revelation of the righteous judgment of God. So he tells them, if you continue to reject Christ, what are you doing? You're making deposits into the wrath bank of God. What's God say? One day he says, your bank's full. What's going on in our culture right now with all the evil that we see just in our country alone? What's God? Well, you're making deposits into the bank of wrath. God's waiting for you to repent and turn to him so he can forgive you and cleanse you. But if you keep making deposits, lying, deceiving, cheating, all the things that go on, deposit, 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 deposit. And finally, one, one day God says, my mercy and my compassion are now, they reach their limit. Now we're moving to the wrath. Um, Romans 5, 9, much more than having now been justified by his blood, Christ, the crucifixion, we will be saved from the wrath of God through him. How do you escape the coming wrath? Know Jesus as your Savior. And that blood covers you, and you, you, you're exempt from the wrath to come. Ephesians 5, 6. Paul says, Let no one deceive you with empty words, vacuous words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. It makes you ask yourself a question. Are the people in my world that are speaking to me and telling me that there's no God, there's no wrath, there's no eternal punishment, et cetera, et cetera, are they, are they telling me these things? Because Paul says these are vacuous words, uh, and people that believe in them will experience the wrath of God. First uh, Thessalonians 1.10. He says, we as Christians wait for his son from heaven. Do we not? Uh, whom he raised from the dead. That is Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. What wrath to come? The day of the Lord. When is the day of the Lord? Uh, well, there's many days of the Lord. It's when he shows up in judgment. But the day of the Lord is the second coming of Christ. When he comes and brings his wrath against all those who rejected him, then all the world will be able to say his judgment, his wrath is just, not unjust. He took his time and revealed it at the right time. He is most just. Interesting. Think about Egypt for it as a case in point. Uh, the Old Kingdom period uh, was formulated in 2649 B.C. Uh, Amenhotep, Amenhotep II, the pharaoh of the Exodus, didn't come around until 1450 B.C. The ex Exodus was in 1446 B.C. So that means for 1,203 years of Egyptian chronology, God was merciful. Who'd they worship? The creator or the creation? Creation. They worship the Nile. They worship the beetle. They worshiped everything. And I didn't say beetles. I said <laughs> beetle. You know, the scarab, beetle, etc. Uh, they worshiped all of these things. And, and so when judgment finally came, when God took on the, the uh, Pharaoh, he, a simple request, tell, t Moses, tell Pharaoh to let my people go into the wilderness for three days and worship me and come back. What Pharaoh say? Not on my watch. I'll never let the Jew leave town. They're my slaves. So then this began the, the, the battle between God and the gods of Pharaoh. Uh, who won that one? Uh, God did. See? He showed his wrath. And when his wrath came, it took 1,203 years to evidence itself so no man could say his wrath was unjust. He showed his power. He showed his wrath was just. The second thing he's, Paul says, God takes his time in bringing, his, bringing things to a fruition because he wants to show people his power, his power as God. Like what kind of power? Well, consider Egypt as a case in point because that's what's argued in the context. Uh, when he took on uh, Pharaoh, um, one of the things that he brought to them was uh, darkness. Why darkness? Well, and it says thick darkness. I mean, have you ever been in a cave and they turn out the lights? I mean, I've been in caves 
when they turn out the lights and you're standing there and your eyes, the rods and the cones never adjust like in a movie, you can never see thick darkness. Um, thick darkness hit Egypt during the plagues, uh, Exodus chapter 10, verses 21 to 29. And what's interesting is there was no luminary light, sun, stars, nothing, no light whatsoever in Egypt. They worshiped the sun god, Ray, uh, the, the sun, sun god, Aten, and Atum, and Horus. God shut all their pantheon down with one plague because he created all of those things. Now, what I find is it's kind of interesting, and it's kind of, I don't know, it's kind of amusing. In, in all of the Egyptian households, there was absolutely no light, black as black could get. Every Jewish house had light. Don't think God sent them to Safeway to buy candles, all right? He didn't say, go get candles, make sure you light them, because there's going to be no light. No, no. There was supernatural light available to all of the Jewish families, only where their homes were, everywhere else it was pitch black. Would you not say this is power from God Almighty? And so what God says is, uh, let me show you my power. What's interesting is when you get to the end of the, of the book of Revelation, chapter 19, God turns the lights of the cosmos off again right before he appears in glory. You're going to be there when he shows up? He will show his power. He takes his time uh, to deal with sin and sinners. Why? He wants to show two things. Test time. What say you? His wrath is just and... His power is most powerful, and it's just as well. The other thing that he does is he uh, has uh, plans concerning the saved, or Christians, verse uh, 23. He said he did so in order that he might, in, in, order that, in order that is a purpose clause in Greek. So what's his other purpose? That, well, that he might make known the riches of his glory upon vessels of mercy, which he prepared beforehand for glory. So who are the vessels of mercy? A Christian, someone who believes in God. He's prepared you for glory. Riches in glory. So what's he taking his time for? So that against the black backdrop of evil, when you see his glory, it will be most impressive and breathtaking. I mean, do you think you're going to walk around your first day of heaven and going, eh, it's, just, it's okay. <laughs> I mean, I, yeah. And how do you feel about the streets? I don't know. It's, it's kind of gold. Oh, wow, you can see through it several thousand feet down. You know, that's kind of cool. I've never seen anything like that, but, you know, hey. Is that going to be you in heaven? No, because you're going to see the, the glory, the, the glory of God. So what does that mean? So think about it this way. Um, I have a, an aunt who's now with Christ. She died when she was 52, my mom's sister, from a, a breast cancer. Godly woman, very wealthy. And one day she went to San Francisco. She was living near there to buy a really nice diamond because uh, she could afford it, something over $100, I'm sure. So she... She goes, and she said, they put out a big piece of black velvet, and they poured some really nice diamonds on that. And she said, and big lights shining down that just popped. She, and I'm like, that's a theological statement. She goes, what are you talking about? I go, well, think about it. I mean, when you think about the greatness of God, what's he do? He paints a completely black evil. He lets evil run its course, and then he showcases his glory against the blackness. That's what he does. We will one day see the glory if you know Christ. Well, what's that mean? That's a whole sermon series, so I'll just summarize it for you. Uh, you holding on to your seat? We're gonna, this is a fast ride uh, on a really big, fast roller coaster. What is the glory like? Well, well let's go through and see what, this, what does the Scriptures say about the glory. Um, number one, it is the brightness of God's presence. So take all the stars in the, in, in the entire known galaxy and beyond. You could combine them all together with their luminosity power. They would pale into insignificance in light of the glory and the brightness of God Almighty. That's the glory. Uh, it has to be shielded from man's naked eyes or it would consume him. Uh, it is like a devouring fire to behold it. That's what they saw on the Mount of Sinai when God came down. Sanctifies unsanctified ground, according to Exodus 29. Uh, it filled God's tabernacle and his temple when he came down. It was filled with the kavod of God, the glory of God. Uh, it was, uh, well, one day, according to Numbers 14, fill the earth. Numbers 14, 22 says it can shockingly be resisted. That you could see the glory of God and still... Choose not to follow him. Uh, it appears to bring judgment against false rulers. Uh, its brilliance is, is seen in the heavens. When you see the sun, the moon, the stars, they just merely point to the fact God is greater than that in his brilliance. Uh, it's the light of the heavenly Jerusalem. Uh, it is the, it's an amazing thing to behold. Rome, Revelation 4 explains what it's like. Um, 
It's a light that is given to saints. It's transformative now as you look to Christ and, and try to live a holy life. You're transformed into his glory. Um, it is the epicenter of Christ on his throne, according to Isaiah 6. Uh, it will be the light in all of eternity. Uh, it calls for man to worship him, by definition, when you see it. It will descend upon the earth one day, and it pulsates in your new body when you see Christ. Remember Moses when he came down from the mount? What was up with his face? He's just using oil of Olay up there or something, and it's looking great. He's 80-something years old. What was up with his face? Shining. And they're like, Moses, we can't even look at you. Because you've been in the presence of God's glory, and his glory is now absorbed into your skin. You're emanating God. This is about a taste of what you'll be like in heaven. No skin issues, by the way. Wouldn't that be awesome? Be in God's presence, white gowns. We know that from Revelation 6. You'll be dressed in white. No other color options. I'm sorry, but it's just what it is. <laughs> you'll be there emanating the glory of God. Why does God wait so long to deal with evil? So that when evil finally gets to the zenith of its evil... God says, wait till you see my glory against the evil. You will appreciate what lies ahead. That's what God's doing. That's the first answer. Second answer as to why God takes his time? Well, uh, answer number two, well, he has plans, specific plans. And it takes him a while to work them out. Remember, a day with God is how long? A thousand years. And a thousand years to God is one day. So how does he view time? Totally different than we do. So we might think, Get with the program. Come on, God, do something now. Uh, he's like, I am. So when you look at his plans, he has two plans that he's worked out in history. Number one concerns Gentiles, and, num- and the other plan deals with Jews. So Romans 9, 24 to 26 is his plan for Gentiles. What is it? He's going to quote uh, from the book of Hosea, uh, chapter 2, verse 23, in verse 25. And then in uh, verse 26, he's going to quote from Hosea, chapter 1, verse 10. What's that mean? Well, notice what he says in Romans 9, 24. He says, even us, whom he also called, not from Jews only, but also from the Gentiles, the goyim. As he says to Hosea, he's going to quote, I will call those who are not my people, my people, and her who was not my beloved, my beloved. And then he says, and it shall be, it shall be that in that place where he has said to them, you are not my people, they shall be called the sons of the living God. This is an interesting thing what Paul does here. He takes God's word to ancient Israel and he applies it to the, to the church age. But it doesn't mean the church replaces Israel because if you go back and you study ancient uh, the prophecy of Hosea, chapter 1, verse 10, where Paul quotes from, through chapter 2, verse 1 of Hosea, he specifically says to ancient Israel, the ten tribes of northern Israel, I'm going to judge you for your sin. And if you want to read about their sin, it's in 2 Kings chapter 16 and 17, great chapters sad chapters, their sin as a nation. He says, I'm going to judge you as my people, and it's going to be like you're not my people. And so how he does this is he tells Hosea, the prophet to the north, he tells him, I want you as a godly man to go marry a prostitute. Whatever for. And he says, well, my nation is like, well, they've gone after the harlot of false religions. I want your life to be a living illustration to them of their sin. And I want you to name your kids names, which will show the nation how I feel about him. So he had a daughter. Uh, actually, had firstborn son. He named him Jezreel. He had a, a, a daughter whose name was Lo Ruhama. Every time he said that name of that daughter, the name in Hebrew means she's not loved. Because God says, because you have not loved me, it's as if I'm not going to love you when judgment comes. And then they had a, a, a son, uh, a second son, and they called him Lo Ami which means, lo in Hebrew means uh, no, and am is the word for people, uh, not my people. He says, you've lived in such sin, I'm going to judge you. It's going to be like I don't love you, and it's going to be like you're not my people. But then in uh, Hebrews, or Hosea chapter 1, 10 through 2, 1, he then comes around and says, but one day I will come back to you, my people, and I will call you who were not my loved one, my beloved I'll love you again as a nation. But what Paul does is he takes this and he applies this to Gentiles. Because he can do this by means of inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He says, God's going to take a people who were not his people. When the Israelites rejected Messiah, he's going to take their rejection and the tragedy of that. And he's going to use their tragedy to use that to make triumph in calling Gentiles. He's going to take the cross to move away from the Jews to then go specifically after Jews and Gentiles, which was foretold all throughout the Old Testament. Remember Genesis uh, chapter 12, verse 3? Uh, God told uh, 
Abraham that one day uh, he would be the father of many nations and bless the earth, Jew and Gentile. Paul said, what's God doing in the tragedy of the cross? Uh, what he had prophesied all throughout the Old Testament, that he would go after Jew and Gentile, and that, as we know now, in the age of the church, they would be called his new people. That's his plan, and it took him thousands of years to work his plan out through all those tragedies of time. So does God uh, have a plan? Absolutely, always. It was to redeem you and I. But is he done with Israel? No. And that's Paul's second part of God's plan, verses 27 to 29. He says, let me quote from Isaiah. He says, Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, the nation of Israel, not the church, the nation of Israel. He says, though the number of the sons of Israel be as the sand of the sea, it is a remnant that will be saved. For the Lord will execute his word upon the earth thoroughly and quickly. And he says, just as Isaiah foretold, quoting again from Isaiah, except the Lord of Sabaoth, that's the Hebrew word for armies, had left to us a prosperity, we would have been like Sodom, and we would have been like Gomorrah. If God would not have been merciful to Israel, we'd be like Sodom and Gomorrah where there were no people left when God judged them. But he said God was merciful to us as Jews because he promised that there would always be a remnant. So when you study Christ's uh, parables, uh, Christ uh, in his parables talks about how his people would reject him. Uh, like uh, the parable of the great banquet or the parable of, um, uh, of the rejection of the landowner. There's many parables. But this is the type of thing where he goes to, to call my people to come to the wedding banquet and they make excuses as to why they can't show up. And then he says to the disciples, go to the highways and byways and call all, the goyim, the Gentiles, to come in. But did that mean that Jesus was done with his nation? No, no. Because if you study Christ's parables, in many of them, he tells you how I'm going to redeem them as I prophesied in Zechariah 12 and 13. I'm going to redeem them, but it's not going to be the whole nation it's going to be those who are ready for my appearance, those who turn to me, that I will redeem them. Why has God taken his time? Why has he taken his time? Well, he has pl he's always has plans. He took thousands of years to redeem me as a Gentile and you maybe as a Jew, but that doesn't mean he's not still working his plan to redeem Israel. That's the next part of his plan. God always has a plan in tragedy to do something terrific. I'm glad he's that kind of God. Let's pray. God, thank you for your greatness, for the depths of your character, for the depth of scripture. Uh, we thank you that the, the scriptures contain milk for the more mature saint, meat for the new saint, uh, and that you give enlightenment and understanding to those who seek you. And we thank you for just how great you are, that your hand is upon the wheel, as we have said, uh, of our culture, of our old world, and you are guiding all things for one day all of us to behold your glory and bow before you and claim you are Lord to the glory of the Father. We give you praise for this day. Might our lives be light that reflects your greatness in Christ's name. Amen.